<laughs> All right. Hello and welcome to yet another uh, Motor One Test Car Happy Hour. My name is Seth Mirsma. Joining me today uh, is Jeffrey Perez. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? Hey, good. And sorry, I'm laughing a little bit. I don't know what you guys heard out there. I think we weren't live. We had a, we had a few false starts with our jaunty theme uh, song to Test Car Happy Hour. So uh, apologies if you're seeing the recorded version of this and you just heard me laughing out of nowhere. That was why. <laughs> um, Cool. So we're talking electric cars today. We're talking uh, to to all of our friends who are following both uh, Motor One and Inside EVs on YouTube and various social channels. I want to encourage all of you, if you're interested in, in electric vehicles um, and typically you're joining us from Motor One, please, by all means, check out InsideEVs.com. Subscribe to the feeds. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. You'll get alerted when we come, come on live with stuff like this. Plus, you'll get the Inside EVs podcast. Um, we love to cross over when it's relevant. And today, um, Jeff and I have three cars to talk about um, that are all either electrified or fully electric. Uh, so I think super relevant and great content, including, we'll talk about it last, probably one of the best cars that I've ever driven in my entire life, which is which is very exciting. So um, as ever, wherever you guys are watching this, we know that Kevin Hawthorne is watching this from Lakeland, Florida, and we're happy to have him on board. Um, if you're seeing this on YouTube or on Twitter or X or whatever, uh, Facebook, please go ahead and leave us a comment. Ask, ask us a question about any of the vehicles we're talking about. We'd love to throw that up and answer your question on air. Um, pick our brains. That's what we're here for. So with that all as preamble, Jeff, why don't we talk, we'll start, we just said, we'll start kind of low to high. We have a lot of high-end stuff to talk about today, um, both in price and in terms of overall electrification. So um, you have recently been in Mazda's new CX-90 plug-in hybrid. So let's let's chat about that guy. Yeah, CX-90 plug-in hybrid. It's an interesting one. Um, obviously, this is the replacement to the former only gas powered CX-9, which was Mazda's uh, previous three row SUV. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is totally new from the ground up, new platform, sort of like the CX-50 uh, new platform. And I think we're looking at the wrong car. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're definitely looking at a Mercedes back right now. So we we probably uh <laughs> we probably jumped over to the to the Mercedes that we're gonna talk Spoiled about. Spoiled it, Kyle. You ruined my surprise. Listen, even even super producer Kyle has some uh flubs every once in a while. And this is one of them. <laughs> Here we go. Now we've got a beautiful it white is. monster. Man, this is a great looking vehicle immediately, yeah. right off the bat, right? It looks really good. I mean, the, the CX50 was kind of the first new SUV that Mazda introduced uh, i want to say a year or two ago at this point with their sort of new design language a little boxier a little more rugged looking um and the cx90 wears the new design super super well i love the front end of this car just like the slim headlights with that sort of accent that goes into the grill um it's kind of the same signature mazda grill we've seen in the past few years just a little tweaked you get a little more cladding over the front bumpers uh some extra detailing that's really nice but in general, this is like their. It's also their first uh, full size, like full three row plug in SUV, mm -hmm. um, and it's one of their first plug in SUVs in general. Um, and it's really, really interesting because Mazda does this thing really well. I think that uh, only a handful of manufacturers can can sort of do is that every Mazda you drive feels like a Mazda for better or worse, right? You you get into a CX ninety. You get into an MX-30, you get into a Miata, and they all have the same sort of strain of DNA that that makes them feel really familiar, mm -hmm. um, which I love. I love that about all Mazdas, um, and the CX-90 is no different. Like, it just really feels, feels really, like, just planted and capable and handles really well. If you're, if you're looking for comfort, it might not be the best three-row SUV because Mazda still does that really stiff suspension that, that they want it to be more performance oriented. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to, if you want a three row that drives like a Mazda, this is, you know, the one to get. Uh, yeah. And then you have, Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to go, go over the powertrain. Um, sure. This one has, this one has the plug-in powertrain, obviously. Uh, 
2.5 liter four cylinder, 68 kilowatt electric motor, 323 horsepower, 369 pound feet of torque, and then up to 26 miles of range yeah. on battery power, which is uh, which is pretty good. Yeah, it's a little lower. I mean, we're talking about a bigger, heavier vehicle than, you know, usually when we, the, the plugins tend to have specs that are along these lines, right? Like somewhere in the 50 to 20 kilowatt hour battery pack range and somewhere between, you know, like 20 to 30 plus miles of, of electric range. Um, when you're, you know, 26 on uh, EPA rating, when you get into the real world, especially, you know, up north where I live, that can get to be, I, you know, my point of view is if it's dipping below 20 real world, then you're you're starting to really lack the ability to use it like an EV a lot of the time, unless you're really doing short jaunts. So that's a bit of a bummer. Um, but it's great to hear um, that that the handling is still there, because one of the things that you know we've talked about a lot, I've, I've had many, many conversations with friends over the years who are really attracted to a Mazda SUV product because of the styling. And then the trade-off that you always, always have to let them know is just what you're talking about, right? Like what you're what you're getting is excellent handling in a vehicle that most people don't care about handling about that much, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what you're losing is sometimes a little bit of space and a little bit of that kind of like pr plush ride quality. So it sounds like they're sticking to their guns there. Have you noticed that the um, plug-in version impacts that in, on any shape, side of the equation at all? Like, does it is it a little bit more well damped because of the because of the heaviness of the the electric drivetrain and battery pack? A little bit. Um, it's not. It's certainly not uncomfortable. I wouldn't say this is an uncomfortable SUV at all. It's it's uh, way. It's certainly on the stiffer side for traditional, you know, three-door SUV. Like you said, nobody really goes to buy a three-door SUV and hopes that it's. It can also do, you know, lap a track or whatever. Sure. Um, but it's not it's not so egregious that it's uncomfortable to live with. The only issue I'm I'm really having is with the powertrain itself. Um, and I can't really say that there are a lot of plug-in hybrid powertrains that are just exceptional, like that totally seamless, smooth, right? right. Yeah. Totally yeah. seamless, totally silent. But the, the CX-90, when you're really at low speeds, it tends to get pretty clunky. It doesn't respond yep. super well to throttle. It sort of takes a second, but then it like lurches forward a little bit too hard. Um, and it just doesn't really, it doesn't really accelerate uh, as quickly as I thought it would. Again, it's an SUV, so that's not super important. But it's still like you really have to get your foot pretty deep into the pedal to get it up to speed. Yeah, um, which can sort of impact things like you know getting on the getting on the on ramp or passing at highway speeds. I think you really have to bury your foot uh, in the pedal on this one. Uh, but it's again, it's it's a plug-in. I think there's there's there aren't a lot of good plugins out there that do the seamlessness of, or the simplicity or just the quietness of a of an EV, right? So that's a little bit of a sacrifice. Yeah. Um, I I want to I want to interrupt real quick because I want to say hi. I've got a couple. One, I want to say hello to I think it's Carl in San Diego, who I recognize from the Inside EVs podcast um, chat and, and comment section saying hi, watching you from you can guess. Thank you for the crossover content, that being the crossover <laughs> between Motor One and Inside EVs. Uh, we thank you so much for watching uh, this this podcast as well as the other ones that we do. We love to love it when we get audiences for both. Um, and then Greg Kramer is uh, weighing in to say that um, he says, hi, it seems nice, but if anything, the CX-90 is just way overhyped. Um, he doesn't get the styling either. In person, it looks very slab-sided. That's interesting because I don't like, and, you know, aesthetics are all like kind of in the, in the eye of the beholder. People see the same shape and think differently about it. I've always thought that like, you know, again, with, with this, the, with the CX-90 in particular, but with most Mazdas, they tend to have really nice sort of sculptural uh, big body panels, which it, in my mind cloak a little bit the size, the length and size of something like this, um, like the, mm -hmm. a, you know, a three row vehicle. So I don't know that we're seeing it exactly the same way, Greg, but what about you, Jeff? Do you think you ever see like dead profile? Does it look a little slabbier than it does in those cool angled shots? It actually does a little bit. I think the okay. side profile is is very so the CX9 was pretty swoopy. I think the design of that was a little more angular and interesting than this is uh in general because the side the side the door panels uh are a little bit flat. Like they they kind of lack the detail that the CX9 did. But I think the whole design the design as a whole is really cohesive and really nice. 
It's just from certain angles it does. Yeah, it does look a little slab sided. Yeah, I, I, I can see that too. And really it does come down to very often um, what you're you know seeing in real life, right? Like yeah. photos and videos. I, obviously, on a, like Kyle's got having a connection issue. Sometimes it can be a little fuzzy or just distorted uh, and, and you see more in reality. So maybe you yeah. and Greg are seeing it the same way. I want to say hi to um, uh, fellow journalist and friend of Inside EVs, uh, friend of all of us, Michael Battencourt, too, who says, uh, Michael says, smart Thursday move. So we'll stop there. This is not the um, Inside EVs podcast, which you'll still be able to see tomorrow morning at 930. We have not moved that yet. We've had that same time slot for about three years. So we're going to you'll see those guys go up tomorrow uh, morning. Uh, this is the the happy hour podcast where we just talk about the cars that we've been talking, the test cars that we've had over the last week or so. And we chat through those on Motor One always. We bring over the Inside EVs audience when um, we're talking about stuff that's electrified um, or fully electric as we are mostly today. So um, and then he asked the question, any DC charging like the Outlander P have uh, or the Range Rover Sport P have? Did I miss EV range? EV range, you did miss. It's around 26 miles, 26 point something miles of pure EV range. And mm -hmm. I don't think, Jeff, you tell me if I'm wrong. I don't think we're the CX-90s architecture supports DC fast charging, right? No, it doesn't, um, okay. which I think is is okay. Most plug-in EVs. A small battery. Small battery. They don't really support level three. Like like you said, the, the Outlander and the Range Rover, I think, are sort of outliers in that respect. But yep. um yeah, no, level three here. But I am glad that Michael brought up the Outlander P have because when you're talking about how many or most of the um, plugins that you've driven, especially, you know, the three rows don't have that really seamless handoff between powertrains. I will say, and I, I only drove a prototype in the very early going, but I did a small first drive on the on the new Outlander plugin. And I thought the powertrain was was silky smooth. Right. And mm -hmm. I, I thought that they had managed that really well. Their point of view was always trying to make the thing kind of act and drive and have the same response as like a full electric vehicle, even though it is it is a hybrid uh, gas and electric vehicle. So that's an interesting one to come back to, Michael, and one that we should we should probably talk about more. We can make that comparison a little bit more. But if you're looking for that smoothness in terms of the drivetrain, I think Mitsubishi has actually done that really, really well. There, there's a lot that I like about that vehicle. In fact, um, it's much smaller. The third row is is basically yeah. <laughs> unusable compared to the. Uh, it's more of an emergency third row. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're looking for third row space, that's uh, that's that's not really a practical option if you want to put adults back there. Uh, yeah, and, and, and the third row here is not like amazing either. To be fair. Um, sure. So it's a, on the pre it's a midsize SUV with a third row, right? So uh, it's a little, the, the CX-90 is a little bit bigger than, it's definitely not a midsize. It's a little bit bigger than that. The Outlander for sure is like a midsize with a, with a small third row. Okay. Um, you can sit back here like as an adult, like six foot tall. And I had enough leg room. Uh, my head was almost sort of touching the top of the, the roof, which is not great. Um, but it's, it's uh, it, like it's just like a barely usable third row, I think, compared to some of the other three rows that you can get out there. Um, you get Napa leather on this one, which is nice. I do like that. Um, so, yeah, the interior is actually really nice. The second row, the captain's chairs on this model, they're all Napa leather front, second and third row. Um, and they're heated second row, which I think is pretty cool. So interior, I actually really like on this car. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cool. Lots. Of, we'll hit some of these quickly and then and then move on because we've got a couple more vehicles to talk about. Um, so Carl is bringing up that the, I mean, let's. I'll I'll start with the, the first one. The Mazda sounds uncompelling. Bad EV. Only range. Comp uh, compromised ride and drivetrain. P have shouldn't be built anymore. If I'm honest, I think like the, I think the criticisms that you're calling out sort of mirror what we've been talking about with the with the CX90 plug-in um, specifically. I actually think that plugins serve a really valuable role right now, both in terms of perception, kind of helping people who are more resistant. And 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 Carl, we know that you're not one of them, right? But but there are people out there who are resistant to electrified vehicles, even as a technology. So I think having that kind of step transition between a full ICE vehicle into a full EV vehicle um, is nice to give people some options. And my point of view too is, you know, you're you are not, um, you know, you're not putting a gigantic inefficient battery into a gigantic inefficient vehicle in something like this too. So you are getting a lot of real world economy. And I mean that on like a personal sort of um, 
uh, you know, your, your own personal finances, right? Like you're spending less money on the vehicle itself. The day-to-day running of it is, is a lot cheaper than a traditional ice vehicle, not on the same efficiency level as an EV, EV et cetera. But um, I, I think that there is a, I think that there's a strong role for this kind of technology as we transition into full, fully electrified uh, vehicles in the future, personally. So, yeah, um, I agree with that. It's, it's a, it's a nice way to transition, I think, sort of the bigger market that's a little bit hesitant to get in a full EV, whether, whether you know, their fears are warranted or not. Yeah. Um, but this is, I think this is a decent option if you want a three-row plug-in uh, before you get into that full EV stage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, cool. Lots to talk about here. Lots of, lots of great conversation. But why don't we move on to, we're going, we're going up the scale. So we're, we're making a gigantic leap. Although I didn't hear, what was the sticker price on the Mazda before we close out on this? So this one is 50, 58, 920 as tested, which is okay. fully, basically fully loaded Napa leather, big wheels. So, I mean, I'm less under 60 grand for a fully loaded three row is not actually terrible when you yeah. look at some of the, the gas three rows out there. No, no, it's not like it's, you know, it still feels like all the money in the world in my, my antiquated brain, but that's a, <laughs> you know, uh, but that's only a little bit above what, what average vehicles are selling for right now. So, and it's about half the conveniently, it's about half the price of the next vehicle we're going to talk about, which is, uh, another Mercedes EQ product. Uh, this one tuned by AMG, right? So what's, and this one's in your driveway now or. Yeah, I just I just drove this one today. It's the nice. Mercedes AMG EQE SUV. A lot of letters there. Lots to um, say. There. And the SUV is critical because we're not talking about it today because I literally just got it. But I have the sedan version of this exact vehicle sitting in my driveway <laughs> right now, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, these are uh, these are some ugly vehicles, huh? <laughs> I don't know. Man, something about all the EQ models just looks so dorky and silly, and I don't understand. Um, when I got this one last week, I actually took a picture and sent it in our sort of work group chat. Yeah. And I was like, oh, it doesn't look that bad with the AMG, you know, wheels and stuff on it. And I think you and Brett were both like, that's terrible. That just looks so bad. Yeah. Um, it does look better with the AMG stuff, I think. Like the wheels are nice. These are the twenty. I think these are twenty-one inches. Um, okay. The the high spoke AMG style wheels, yep. black badging, some extra black accents on there, um, and then you get that cool sort of deep blue uh, paint job, which is really nice. But yeah, it's um, it's very familiar if you've been in any other EQ product, right? They mm. sort of have the same layout. They have the big hyper screen inside. Yep. Um, the super aggressive sporty seats, the, the driving position in this is odd. I have to sit like weirdly high to sort of see over the, the dash and the instrument cluster because everything feels really cluttered. And then the windshield is like really raked back far. Mm -hmm. Um, so it looks, it's probably like a midsize SUV typically on the outside. Like it has that midsize SUV size and shape, but then the front compartment just feels really, really cramped. Um, that was my first like critique when I got in the car, but then you drive it and holy hell is this thing fast. So <laughs> You're right. 617 horsepower, 701 pound feet stock, just this, the standard AMG version. If you get the dynamic plus package that bumps it up to 677 horsepower and 738 pound feet with the, uh, sort of the overboost like launch control activated. So it's mm -hmm. only for a few seconds, but man, this thing will launch like a freaking rocket. This is, um, I was, I was like not in love with this the first few minutes I was driving it. And then you sort of activate all the fancy sports stuff and, and launch it one or two times. And it's kind of wins you over a little bit. I think in general still, I'm not like in love with it, but, uh, the performance is, is pretty damn good on this thing. Yeah, I mean, it feels very much like a like a um, you know very new, very modern competitor to what people have loved about uh, the the Tesla Model X uh, when when that one first launched, right? So an expensive uh, SUV with with good size, with kind of very futuristic styling and tons of power, tons of acceleration. Uh, that that wow factor that that I think people really craved in the in the like kind of first and second generation of, of fully electrified vehicles that we were driving, right? So 
I, I think this is a really interesting vehicle. I, I also agree sort of the, the styling is polarizing. We've got Greg K Kramer saying he likes it better than the Mazda that we were just looking at. Um, I would I would take issue with that. However, I will say that the once you're sitting in the car, now we, we, you're, you're probably right. Like I need to feel the seating position here and figure out whether or not it, it actually fits and like the, the seats feel great. But Mercedes is doing some of the best work in the entire world right now across the board from like bottom. This isn't, this is not just with their, you know, hundred thousand dollar AMG kind of flagship products. Um, I think their interiors are really innovative looking, really interesting shapes, cool materials, um, typically really great seats, uh, mm -hmm. front and rear, you know what I mean? Like, and then I, I don't need to have a hyper screen in my life. I don't, I don't dislike yeah. it either. I don't feel that strongly one way or the other. I would go if I had the option to get, any one vehicle without hyperscreen, I probably wouldn't pay extra to have it because I don't need it. But it does look completely sort of streamlined and like just it, like one flowing piece when you're in the cabin too. So um, yeah, I, this, I appreciate it for sure. The seats are really great. The front and rear seats are just like super, super comfy. And the AMG ones here are, are really well bolstered. Like they keep you in place. It's a seating position that I'm just sort of, I can't get, it's hard to get a, good seating position. I'm either sitting too high or too low and it's hard to see over the dash. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the seats, the materials, the interior is really, really nice. Hyper screen, I'm with you. I could like live without it. I think it's just way too much when you're driving. It's, it's too hard to use everything uh, that you might want to when you're driving, especially with the amount of sort of like stuff that they just bake into the screen. Um, mm -hmm. But it's cool. And passengers have their own screen too, which is nice. Um, so when people get in this car, they're like blown away by the technology and especially at night, the ambient lighting, the red seat belts. So it's definitely a, it's a really cool and, and nice interior. Yeah. Uh, so Michael is asking, um, is it the most beautiful, most beautiful EV interior or interior overall? I don't think it's the most, I don't know if it wins that I would need to put a little thought in, in what I would rank as like my top all time interiors. Although again, the car we're about to talk about next will, will be high on that list. I just mean that as a, as a brand Mercedes, I think is doing, if you, you look at any segment that they compete in right now, any of their, you know, their vehicles, I think that they're usually the best or in the top three of their interiors uh, in, in the segments in which they compete. And that means electrified and non EQ AMG and certainly Maybach. I think Maybach is right up there with the best in the world with some of their interiors as well. So, um, and then we had uh, Carl was at saying his opinion on uh, AMG EVs. If you want to build a faster AMG version of cars, you should detune the other, um, EQ E or other EQ cars, presumably build the base cars with even more frugal powertrains, which Merck does well. I think that's fair. Like we've, you, you, we haven't talked about this yet, but we've had lots of conversations and I think the AMG versions of Mercedes product products come to, come into it. Certainly we've talked about this with this kind of faster versions, the tuned up versions of BMW EVs that it doesn't always feel worth the price, right? To have that extra power because the base models of so many of these vehicles are already really quick. Top speed isn't a concern in, in normal driving anyways. Um, and in many cases, you know, to the interior point we're making, like there are really, they have really nice other features, technology, uh, great seating, great capacity and all of that um, without having to spend more money on the, on the performance version. Do you, do you think this is at the end of the day, like you're getting enough for the AMG version of, of EQE SUV? Um, you know, I haven't driven the regular EQE SUV, so sure. it's hard to say that it's worth whether or not I, I can fully say that it's worth it or not is like yet to be, I'll have to figure that out. Um, the IX versus the IX M60 was one of those that had that problem where it was like the base IX is really good. It's really quick, really nice. And then the M60 just doesn't feel like it's worth the extra, you know, 20 or 25 grand, whatever it was. I think the the tuning here and the performance that AMG added is a little more thoughtful and or a little more mm -hmm. meaningful. And maybe that's just a result of BMW not having a full M version, uh, right. like this full AMG version. But I think it, it could be worth it um, if you really want something that's sportier than your traditional electric suv some of the some of the aspects are really good the handling is really nice the steering is like 
it has that really chunky steering wheel with that really heavy sort of weightiness that you get on a lot of the EQ or the um, AMG gas cars, which I like. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, the acceleration is just ridiculous. So I would say that it's it's probably worth it if you want um, an electric AMG. Yeah, and I mean, there are a few comments here about people like being after the badge, and I think that's fair. Right now, EQ is so new. You know, like my old argument was G-Wagon was maybe the most uh, aggressive version of this, right? Where getting an AMG version of a G-Wagon in years past was, to me, like so silly because it's not, even when it's fast, it's not great at going around a corner fast, right? Um, so there's no real reason to make it like hyper powerful other than to say that you had one that had a like, you know, shorter zero to 60 time or something like that. Or, you know, because your neighbor, if you are in a posh neighborhood, maybe has the standard G wagon. And so you went out and you spent a lot more money and you got one with an AMG badge on it. I think that sometimes has been true of, of M cars too. BMW M has more of a reputation of being a car that people take to the track. I suppose it depends on which one. I don't know if that, I don't know if we're playing in that space right now with, with EQ and with the, this new realm of, of electric vehicles. Maybe I'm being naive there. Like maybe people really do care a lot about the badge or the specs, even though it doesn't matter. Um, but it's less clear to me, I guess, than it was in the established, uh, um, you know, kind of way that they were selling cars uh, when they were just selling ICE cars. Yeah, people will probably pay for the badge either way. Uh, sure. AM, AMG, you know, RS badges. Like they, people love those cars and they have a history with those cars. So I think the transition to EVs for some of them, it just would be a natural progression to just say, hey, I'm just going to buy the, the AMG version that I, you know, the gas car that I had, whatever, or the M version. So mm -hmm. it makes sense. Yeah. Um, cool. I mean, that's, that's that's covering a lot of ground. We're, we're moving quickly here today, but why don't we? I've, I've got a lot of uh, I've got a lot of expansive thoughts about the Rolls Royce, so we can we can continue on on our, our journey up the up the scale. Um, so yesterday, you, you guys might would be forgiven for not knowing because it's not a lot of news is coming out of it. But the Detroit Auto Show is actually going on right now. I was over there yesterday, and because uh, lots of journalists are in town. Um, a lot of automakers are doing sort of small events around Detroit and Southeast Michigan, including Rolls Royce. So um, I was really happy to get invited by Rolls Royce to uh, Meadowbrook Hall in Rochester, Michigan. Really lovely location to go. They brought, um, I think they had four Spectres. <laughs> um, they have four Spectre and then a couple of Ghosts for uh, comparison's sake. Um, and I got to take one on a... a not quite an hour drive loop, um, sort of through traffic on the highway on a couple of twisty roads. Kyle has actually picked the wheels are wrong, but the exact colorway of the car that I had, which is this green, I have it pulled up because I'm so bad at remembering color names. Uh, Monteverde green, uh, black, like a, 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 a sort of sparkly black center panel over this beautiful Monteverde green in a really car, a, a car that's like incredibly stunning. So let's, let's start here. Um, Spectre is Rolls-Royce first uh, fully electric car. I think there's some like electrified and electric concepts that they've done in years past, but this is the first one for consumers. Um, we have a first drive of it on Inside EVs from earlier this summer or late in the spring, uh, where I think a lot of my comments will be echoed of, about it being a fantastic car. Um, we're talking about uh, you know 260-ish miles of range um i have the specs pulled up here too i think it's 561 uh horsepower hold on yeah so fi sorry 584 horsepower 664 pound feet of torque um and a claim zero to 60 speed of uh just under four and a half seconds um none of that matters <laughs> <laughs> right uh the, the range doesn't really matter. The, you know, efficiency, um, which I'm sure is not as far from class leading this vehicle doesn't really matter. Um, honestly, even the, even the power and the acceleration don't matter that much because it is, uh, the, the one that I drove was $530,000. And they're just not playing in the same, like, not even time zone. They're not even on the same planet as, as other, uh, you know, even, even 
things like Mercedes AMG products, right? Like Mercedes Maybach um, are really lovely and really refined and nice to drive. And, you know, no, unquestionably a better value if you're considering like what you're getting for every dollar spent. Um, but I was talking to uh, the PR guy, his name is Jerry Spawn, um, before we got, or right after I got out of my drive. And he sort of, he was, he was joking, uh, he was being serious, but in a, in a jokey way, because we were talking about the, the vents in the car, which are, you know, a directional, a, a round porthole style vent that like directionally can go up, down and side to side, and they're chromed metal. And they don't look that much different than something you might see in a Mercedes or a Lexus or something like that. The difference is when you actually, when I would ping my fingernail against them, they make a sound like I'm clinking two pieces of, of uh, fine silver together, right? <laughs> like it's very clearly a super heavy, um, really beautifully finished piece of metal. And we were talking about that. And Jerry made this offhand comment like, yeah, it's amazing what you can do with a car like this when you don't have to worry about engineering everything to a price, <laughs> right? Which is probably the most obvious thing that you can say about a Rolls Royce, but also it's like, it's really relevant to understanding what it's like in every other vehicle, in the in, in Mercedes EQ universe, in, you know, like, Tesla and, and Polestar and even, even uh, Lucid and Rivian were operating at a higher price point. They still need their, their cost to be at a certain level so that they can sell at a certain price and hit a, a large enough market to make money on it. Rolls Royce is emphatically not that. They're like, how do we make this as good as it can be and then just sell it for whatever it costs plus our markup, which is an entirely different way to engineer a car. Um, so... That alone, I think, is is really instructive in in like how like the car goes down the road because the seats are incredible. Of course, it's got all the the stuff that you would expect that makes it feel really special right away. The lambs wool floor mats or whatever. I I actually can't guarantee that. I was supposed to get a um like a build sheet on this car that I haven't received yet, but um you know just like the most beautifully appointed um, upholstery inside the car. Everything's incredibly plush. All of the touch points are beautiful, feel nice, look perfect, are impeccably finished. And then driving the car is sort of the same way, right? It is um, incredibly fast, despite the fact that it's not, the specs are sort of down relative to other, you know, kind of crazy performance electric vehicles. Um, Rolls has intentionally done some of this. They limit torque on initial throttle input. Um, they wouldn't say how much but they want the car to pass what they call the champagne test, number one, which is if you, and I guess the, the story goes that the, the, um, the CEO actually does this on occasion when he's in the back with the driver, put a glass uh, of champagne on the, on, you know, the tray table or center console or something like that. And then the driver has to accelerate spiritedly. And if the car moves enough to cause the champagne to spill, then they go back, they need to retune the car. Right. Um, so one thing they didn't want to have in this car is they didn't want that like feeling you get in a, in a plaid or a lucid air sapphire or something like that, where your face is just getting sucked back into the seat because they need the car to sort of perfectly and powerfully, but still gently pull away from the line or accelerate through traffic and, and too much torque at the wrong time upsets that experience. So, mm -hmm. um, it's just fascinating. Like it's, it's completely a completely different universe that, that, like I said, that this car is operating in, um, in, in every respect, including driving and riding in it. So there are like a few brands where you have this sort of expectation before you get in the car where it's either, you know, you think this is going to be amazing. Or you think it's going to be not great. And, and a lot of times like, you know, certain cars you, you're like, okay, this is pretty good. Maybe not as good as I thought it was going to be. Every Rolls Royce I've been in, is every bit as good as you think it is like yeah. the the attention to detail the the uh what is it the lamb's wool carpeted floor mats or whatever yep. that is some of the best just for like in car material i've ever put my hands on and something as little as just the air vents that that pinging you get when you hit on, when you touch the air vents i can only imagine how good this thing is having not driven it uh, but it's just it's amazing what they can do I mean, not like you said, the specs aren't even that impressive when you sort of compare them to other high-end EVs, but it's a Rolls Royce. Who cares? Like everything they've done on this car is impeccable and amazing. And I just, I love the way it looks. It's such a good looking car. 
Yeah, I agreed. And I, I think one thing that didn't come through for me when I when I was seeing the initial photos and like our uh, first contact can't come through, I, I, I thought that this was kind of an ugly car, um, partially because the grill is so bold. And, and going back a few comments, I think I think maybe Carl is representing what a lot of people would think, um, maybe maybe in real life, too. But looking at it, saying it's really challenging not to look douchey driving a Rolls Royce this flashy um, and you buy it to look good. So that's a flawed formula. I, I think that it's way more impressive and a lot less douchey or over the top looking uh, than you might expect when you see it in real life. Though there's no question it's something very different <laughs> from from everything else that's on the road, too. So I, who knows? I think I think people bring their own perceptions of brands and. And obviously knowing the price point like changes it a lot too. Um, uh, that's, that's more of an individual thing, but like as an object in space and on the road, I, I think that it actually looks really, really good and far better than I expected it to as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's really fun. And, uh, and then, and then uh, Kyle asked, does the average Rolls Royce buyer really care though? Let's consider that many who can afford a Rolls wouldn't be uh, the one that's driving it they would be getting driven. So I, I just want to like, I think that's not an uncommon thought. And I think that people think of Rolls Royce and they think chauffeured cars. And, and that's fair because they have that history and, and they've engineered, I would say, all of their cars with only a few exceptions to be just as elegant to ride in as to drive. Right. But I think it's long, like Rolls, is, Rolls Royce has long since said, at least in North America and certainly with the U.S., U.S. owners drive their cars. They are not chauffeured in their cars, right? So they do have to be good to drive. It's not It's not a moot point at all. In fact, it's really germane that like a car like this, and of course, this is a coupe. It's got about the biggest single door I've ever seen in my entire life. It's still really easy to access the rear. There's plenty of room. You can have that sort of ex executive experience if you do want to ride in it. But this is meant to be, this is meant to be a driver's Rolls Royce. It's meant to be a car that you drive, not ride in. So... Um, yeah, and uh, one of the things that uh, I talked to Rolls, one of the designers at Rolls Royce last year at Pebble Beach, and one of the things that they love to talk about is how young, how much younger their clientele is getting, right? With the Cullinan, in, and I assume with this one, it's a big, it's a big celebrity car, obviously, and yeah, it can be kind of douchey some of them with the crazy colors and wheels or whatever they put on, but uh, the fact that the the buyers are getting younger is sort of interesting and. I think that the Spectre is only going to do more to enhance that with, with the electric powertrain. And you can only imagine that in the next few years, there's got to be more EVs from, from Rolls Royce coming down the line. So it's such a natural fit. And it's, you know, it's, it's sort of cliche to say at this point, and, and Greg makes a good, the good point too. And I think he's right. It's hard to get excited about a car that's for a few hundred people. That's true. I think from one point of view, like, will this have a massive impact on the market? Is it going to move the needle in terms of electrification and technology? I think the answer is no. I think the reason that this car is interesting is the same reason that like the, the cars that you see at, at Concour, like Pebble Beach and um, Amelia Island are interesting because it's got a crazy high level of a t uh, craftsmanship and attention to detail and can do things both on the move and sitting still that you simply can't afford to do in other cars that you have to sell at a lesser price point. So I, I get it. Like it's not an important car in a macro sense. Um, it's important for Rolls Royce as a brand and, and, you know, I guess vaguely important for BMW as the parent company, although they operate really, really independently. Um, but it's, it's definitely an interesting car. I think if you're interested in, in cars or transportation at all, um, if for no other reason than because they've, they've seamlessly, they've, they've changed the powertrain entirely. They've never had a fully electric vehicle before. Electrification absolutely plays to the inherent brand strengths of Rolls Royce. And so they've made this transition to an electric vehicle by only enhancing everything. No, like there is no real downside at all to driving a Spectre over a Ghost, for instance, because everything that Ghost does, I think Spectre does better. And everything that's important about being a Rolls Royce is amplified by an electrified powertrain. So, um, I just think it's really special. I mean, it's 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 not important, but it's really special. Um, and I'm happy to have had a chance to drive it at least for a little while. Would love to say we'd get another one too, but uh, getting the loans of those half million dollar cars is not as easy as you might think. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, even 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 for for car riders like us. So yeah. Um, 
Cool. This has been great. I don't know. Again, only three cars and two of us today, so we're a little bit a little bit shorter anymore, uh, shorter than we uh, typically are. Um, I want to thank thank you guys a lot. This has been a great like active conversation. Lots of comments and questions. If you do happen to catch this podcast afterwards, when uh, you know after we're live, um, go ahead and leave us a comment or ask us a question on YouTube, and we try and get through those at least you know once or twice a week to answer anything that's outstanding. Um, in the meantime, we will be back next week, Thursday at 2.30 p.m., 11.30 a.m. Pacific time um, to talk about a lot more cars. I've, I've already sort of previewed. I've got a – well, I've got another one to talk about too, but I've got an AMG in the driveway right now, another the, – the sedan version of the car that Jeff is driving. Um, so lots more cars and lots more fun. Yeah, definitely. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next week.